I want us to look into Hebrews, the, the sixth chapter. Sometimes you hear people talking about the laying on of hands, that sometimes they say, well, so-and-so is just trying to make a doctrine out of the laying on of hands. But no, you see, you don't have to make a doctrine out of it. Jesus made a doctrine out of it. You just follow the scriptures and you find out it is one of the six fundamental doctrines of Christ. Let's read from Hebrews, the sixth chapter, verse one. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God, of doctrines of baptisms, of the laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. Now, if you'll notice here, he lists six of the fundamental doctrines of Christ. Now, there's a word here in this uh, passage of Scripture that if you're not careful, it can confuse you a little bit. It's the word not laying again the foundations. Now, the word that's translated foundation here does not mean foundation as we know foundation is something you build upon. It literally means the casting down are casting away. So he's saying, don't cast away all these other things, but go on to perfection. Uh, if you have a Strong's Concordance, you can look into that, and it'll give you some more insight to that. Many times in the scriptures where you find the word foundation, it means the casting down. Jesus was the Lamb of God that was slain from the foundation of the world. That does not mean from the time the world began to be planned. That means from the falling, a uh, casting down of the world system. It talks about from the time of the fall. Now, if we notice here, he is making a statement about the doctrines of baptisms and the laying on of hands. So the laying on of hands is one of the fundamental doctrines of Christ. Let's go now over to Luke, the fourth chapter. There's some things about the laying on of hands that if we get an understanding of it, it helps us to be better equipped to receive the things that God has for us. In Luke chapter 4, let's notice in verse 38, it says that he rose out of the synagogue and entered into Simon's house, and Simon's wife's mother was taken with a great fever, and they besought him for her. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her, and immediately she rose and ministered unto them. Now, you'll notice in this gospel, the gospel of Luke, it does not record it. One of the others does. I believe it's Matthew's gospel. Records that he touched her hand, and the fever left her. Now, there is a transmitting of the healing power of God and the anointing of God. It is transmittable by touch. This is the doctrine of laying on of hands. It has several things that it does actually, and we'll get into some of those a little further on. But the laying on of hands is a method of calling things that are not as though they were. It is a method of calling the sick well. If you remember what Jesus said in the 16th chapter of Mark before he ascended to the Father, he said, these signs shall follow them that believe. And he said, I'm going to the Father. He was going to ascend to the right hand of the Father. He says, now you go in my name, you cast out demons, you speak with new tongues, you lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So when any believer... And you see, any believer can lay hands on the sick. Now, certainly there are times that God anoints with special anointing of the laying on of hands or different special anointing and different gifts of the Spirit, gifts of healings. But yet, any individual, any believer has the right to lay hands on the sick by faith and expect them to recover. So when any person lays hands on the sick for the purpose of expecting to see them recover, they are simply calling things that are not. You can lay hands on an individual, they're sick. The reason you lay hands on them is for the purpose 
of being obedient to what Jesus said, and by that act, you are calling them recovered. Somebody says, well, they're not recovered. I know that. That's the reason you lay hands on them, (laughs) to call them recovered. Now, you see, there is the principle of calling things that are not. I wanted to get into that, but I felt directed to the Spirit of God to go in this direction, but I will say some things about it. Because God called Abraham, the father of many nations, 25 years before he ever had the promised child. Before Isaac was ever born, God called him the father of many nations, said, I have made thee the father of many nations. In other words, God said it's already done. As far as he was concerned, it was done. But yet, Abraham didn't have the manifestation of it. So you see, calling things that are not is a Bible principle. The Bible says that God did it, and it tells us that Abraham did it. Then the Apostle Paul hooked on to it in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, and he talks about the fact that God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He's chosen the weak things of the world to confound the mighty, and he's chosen those things that are not. Now, he means not manifest. He has chosen things that are not manifest, to bring to naught things that are. Now, how many of you know what naught means? It means zero, doesn't it? God chose things that are not manifest to the natural, physical, five senses realm. He chose that to reduce to nothing things that are manifest in the natural realm. So if you have a problem and you can see it, feel it, touch it, taste it, or so on, if it's in the five senses realm, then God's method is to take a spiritual force that is not manifest, that you can't see, feel, touch, and bring to naught the thing that is manifest. Now that's God's method. Call things that are not as though they were. Now if we're not careful, if you look at that, Sometimes people get a hold of the faith message and because of a lack of understanding of what God has chosen in this realm, they begin to call things that are as though they're not. Now that's not God's method. God's method is to call the thing that's not manifest as though it was manifest until it is manifest. Now see, that's what he did with Abraham. He called him the father of many nations for 25 years before he ever became the father of nations. I mean, physically speaking, before he had ever had the child, God had already established it. And then, of course, he forced Abraham into confessing that too. Now, when we say confess, if you're not careful, you let your mind run off into the area of confessing sins. When we talk about confessing the word of God or confessing our faith, we're talking about saying the same thing that God said about any given situation that the Bible talks about. See, if it's sickness or disease, if you confess what God said about it, then you're on your way to healing. But you see, most people want to confess what is. They want to establish the present circumstances. Well, my arthritis is acting up. Oh, it's yours, is it? I thought it was the devil's. It doesn't belong to me. My heart attack. Oh, is it yours? Or is the devil just trying to give it to you? You see how sometimes we confess the things that don't belong to us. Listen, if you buddy up with the devil and agree with him, he'll go home with you. And he'll live at your house. But it's time that we begin to realize that if we'll agree with God's word and confess what God says about the situation. Sickness and disease is the work of the devil. It's not of God. And when we begin to confess what God says, we're calling things that are not. Somebody says, well, I don't understand how that you could say you believed you've received your healing when you still hurt. And the x-ray shows the tumor is still there. How can you say you believe you've received your healing? Well, the Bible says they lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. They laid hands on me. I must be recovering. 
I didn't say I felt healed. I didn't say I looked healed. I didn't say that anybody else believed I was healed. I'm saying I'm agreeing with what God says. Now, see, the laying on of hands is a method of calling things that are not as though they were. It's not a method of denying what exists. See, when you deny what exists, there's no power in denying what exists. Just to say, I'm not sick, I'm not sick, I'm not sick. There's no power in that. But you see, you don't want to go around confessing, I am sick, I am sick, and I'm having this heart attack all the time either, because that would be establishing the present situation. What we want to do is reduce to nothing the present situation by the word of God, by the spiritual force of God's law, and confess what God said about our situation. The word says he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. So thank God I believe he sent his word and I believe it healed me. I believe I'm delivered from my destruction. Now you see, that is using God's method. As I said, there is no power in denying what exists in the area of sickness and disease. If a person is sick, there's no power in saying, I'm not sick, I'm not sick. Because if you could get rid of whatever you had, let's say you had emphysema, lung disease, and you start saying, well, I'm not sick, I'm not sick, I'm not sick, thank God I'm not sick, I'm not sick. If you could get rid of emphysema that way, you might die with ingrowing toenail or cancer or something else, you see. So that's not the answer, is it? What is the answer? To call health into your body. Call healing. Call your body well. There are several methods of doing this. You can do it in prayer. You can do it by prayer. You can do it by confessing God's word. And all of these methods is beneficial to the one that is sick and seeking to be healed or delivered from their situation. There's about seven Bible methods to get your healing. And we could employ all of them if we want to. But specifically in this session, we're talking about the laying on of hands, which is a method of calling the sick well. It is a fundamental doctrine of Christ. It is something that he did in all of his ministry, laying hands on the sick, and they were healed. Now, what we need to realize is that just because we have confessed something doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to happen in the morning. And not only that, it doesn't necessarily mean because someone lay hands on you that you'll have your healing instantly. See, divine healing is a spiritual work. It is not something that just takes place instantly. Healing is a process. Now, most people, when they think about divine healing, they're really thinking about divine miracles, a miracle that happens instantly. Thank God for those. Many times we've had people healed instantly, but not always. It's a process. Many times you may have to confess the word of God, hold fast to your confession of faith, believe God and say, thank you, Father, when they laid hands on me, I believe I received my healing. Although I don't have the manifestation of it instantly, don't have it now, I shall have it. Now, you have to be careful with that, because when you teach this way, people get the idea, well, now, what he's saying is that i got to throw all my medicine away. No, no, we hadn't said a thing about throwing medicine away. Now, let me show you something about medicine. Medicine won't heal you. It'll aid the body in the healing process. Some of it will. I had an individual say to me one time, well, now, Brother Caps, he said, I wouldn't ask you to pray for me. I said, well, why not? Well, he said, I'm taking medicine. I said, well, what's the medicine supposed to do? Well, he said, the doctor said it'd help me. I said, well, the Bible says prayer will help you. Laying on the hands would help you. Look like if we do both of them, you might get well twice as fast. <laughs> hmm? Now, see, the devil would like you to believe that if you're going to believe God, you can't take medicine, or if you're going to take medicine, you can't believe God. Who says you can't? I say it this way. If you're taking medicine, if you're not developed to the point you can receive your healing by other means, if you're taking medicine, if you'll take it in the name of Jesus, it'll work twice as good. <laughs> 
if medicine doesn't heal you, then it wouldn't keep you from getting healed. Y'all still out there? Did you go home? Hmm? If it can't heal you, why would it keep you from getting healed? Now, you see, you say, well, if you believe you received your healing, what do you need medicine for? Well, you may still have the symptoms. See, you go out here and cut a tree down in the summertime when the leaves are green and grab a handful of those leaves and take them and ask somebody, is this tree dead? They say, well, no, that tree's alive. That tree is cut off from the source of life. It's dead. The leaves just hadn't withered yet. And you see, sometimes we have to hold fast to some things. Now, where people get in trouble is when they are going to prove that they have faith, when they don't have faith. See, faith without works is dead, the Bible says. Acting as though you had faith when you have none is double dead. <laughs> I mean, like someone said, well, bless God, they laid hands on me. So I guess I got my eyes restored. I'm going to stomp my glasses. That'll prove I have faith. It may prove somebody will have to lead you to work in the morning. (laughs) So what is the key to it? Believe God. If you don't have the manifestation, hold fast to the confession of your faith. And confess the word of God over. Thank God I believe I've received restoration. I believe I've received my healing. Now let me give you two examples of what I'm talking about. In Little Rock, Arkansas, there was a man that had just been born again. He was a new Christian. He got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost and heard about being redeemed from the curse of the law. He had gone to the doctor. He was taking medicine. He had sugar diabetes. He had enlarged heart. He had high blood pressure. He had cancer of both lungs. He had something else. I don't remember what it was. He had five things. Any one of them was enough to kill him. And he got excited. You see, excited faith sometimes does foolish things. And uh, he got excited about it, and he just said, thank God, I just threw all my medicine away. I'm just going to believe God. Now, here's a man that hadn't developed his faith enough to believe God for a parking place, much less get healed of something. (laughs) See, he's not developed to that. Don't ever let people push you out where you're not developed to. Don't ever act on somebody else's faith. Now, he threw his medicine away, and he almost died. I counseled with him on one occasion or more, and and another friend of mine did. And I said this. I said, now, why don't you go ahead and take your medicine? Take your insulin. Insulin never healed anyone of sugar diabetes. Never has healed anyone. All it does is furnish the insulin your body needs. It won't make your pancreas go to work. So when you take a dose of that, what it does, it keeps down the symptoms. So when you take a dose of it, say, thank God I believe I received my healing. Amen. Thank God I believe I received my healing. And so he started doing that, confessing the word of God. See, he took God's word, the laying on of hands. They laid hands on him, prayed for him. He, he believed he receives his healing. He is confessing the word of God, and he has taken his insulin. Now, in three months' time, I saw the doctor's report. The doctor's report said, you're going to have to quit taking the insulin. It's working against you. You don't need it anymore. He said, I don't understand it, but you don't need it anymore. He said, your enlarged heart is perfectly normal. He said, your blood pressure is normal for a man of your age. And incidentally, he had the highest blood pressure. The doctor says the highest blood pressure he ever saw a man have and live. And he said the spot in your lungs, on the left lung, he said it's completely gone. In the right lung, it's still got a little spot there, but it's much smaller. Now, here's a man over a 90-day period is almost totally healed. And I'm satisfied if he hadn't got back on his medicine, he would have died. See, and then the doctor tells him in 90 days, he says, you don't have to take your medicine, you know, it's cleared up. He said, I don't understand it. Now, here's the reason I wanted you to see this is because that sometimes people act in presumption. And sometimes I've heard people say, you know, and I've heard people lay hands on people and tell them, now you go throw all your medicine away. See, 
He may have great faith, but he don't know where they're involved. Now, if God tells you to do that, then, you see, that's between you and God. But don't let any man tell you to do that. Because it has to be by the Spirit of God. Now, many times there may be an instant manifestation of it. I've had things that happened in our meetings that sometimes they'd happen instantly. Others is over a period of time. So you see, divine healing is not a miracle. It is a process where that healing begins from that time and continues. Thank God for the miracles. We have nothing against miracles, but not everybody receives a miracle. The Lord said to me one time, he said, some people can't believe me, but five seconds. And he said, if they don't get an instant manifestation in that first five seconds, they didn't get it. Yeah, they go off feeling to see if it's gone. If it's not, they say, I didn't get anything. Well, see, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the spiritual force of God that is capable of bringing into manifestation the thing that you hope for. See, God chose spiritual forces that are not seen to reduce to nothing the things that are seen. So if you have sickness or affliction in your body that the doctors can diagnose that you know it is a physical ailment, then thank God there is a spiritual force called faith that is capable of reducing that to zero. But we have to learn how to operate in this. And see, it makes a difference when you believe in the laying on of hands. If you don't know about the laying on of hands, if you don't know why they're doing it or what's going on, then you don't know how to release your faith. So that's the reason we're teaching on the subject of laying on of hands. So you'll know what it means when people lay hands on you for the purpose of calling you well. Now here in the fourth chapter, of Luke, you notice that as Jesus came and one gospel says that he touched Peter's mother-in-law's hand, and here in Luke it says that he rebuked the fever, and she arose and ministered to them. It left her. Now someone made the statement, well, that's the reason they believe that Peter denied Jesus because he healed his mother-in-law. <laughs> but I don't believe that. But I don't think that was the case. <laughs> now let's notice that he touched her, it departed from her, and she arose and ministered unto them. In verse 40 it says, Now when the sun was setting, all they that had any sick or diseased, divers diseases, brought them unto him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Now, you'll notice that he laid his hands on them for the purpose of bringing the manifestation of the healing. Now, sometimes in the ministry of Jesus, it was almost always instantly. There were some things that didn't happen instantly, but it was almost always instantly. And you notice it says that he healed every one of them. They all got healed. Now, as you come over into the fifth chapter of the book of Luke, let's begin reading with verse 17. It says, It came to pass on a certain day that he was teaching. There were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by who were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. The power of the Lord was present to heal them. Now, I want you to notice the statement that the Bible says here, that here were all of these doctors of the law sitting around from out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. But as you go ahead and read this, you find out there's only one got healed in that whole crowd. And that was a man that brought on a stretcher. But the power of the Lord was present to heal them all. But them all didn't get healed. Now, the reason for that is because them all didn't believe. We'll not take time to turn to it, but in the 13th chapter of Matthew, verse 15, Jesus quotes and speaks of what Isaiah said about their eyes they have closed, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and their heart be converted, and I should heal them. 
In other words, they didn't have ears to hear. They didn't come to Jesus' meeting to get healed. They didn't come to Jesus' meeting to get anything specifically. They came to catch him in his words. So when light came, they closed their eyes. They squinted. That's the same Greek word, closed, there. It's translated closed as we get our word squinted from. You walk out of this building into the sunlight and you have to squint your eyes because the sun is so bright. So when light came, they closed their eyes. The power of the Lord was present to heal them, but them didn't get healed. <laughs> Only him got healed, the one that they brought on the stretcher. Now let's read it. Behold, men brought in a bed a man that was taken of palsy, and they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop, let him down through the tiling, with his couch into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. And, of course, that stirred up the people there, because the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But now I want you to notice something. Here's a man that is sick of the palsy. They have carried him up on the housetop. They've torn the roof off and let him down in the midst. Now, the power of God is present to heal all that multitude, but only this one man gets healed. And you see what Jesus said about it here in verse 23. Whether it's easier to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, or say, rise up and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He saith unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy couch, and go into thy house. And immediately he arose before them, and took up that whereon he lay, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, being filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. <laughs> well, they would have seen stranger things if they would have believed. Because, you see, we read there just a little bit ago where that he healed the whole multitude. He laid hands on them, healed them all. But here, in this particular situation, in this particular crowd, there's only one man that got healed. And that was the one they brought on the stretcher. When he saw their faith. See, they had to have some faith or they wouldn't have brought him all that way. Now, you have to realize there was some planning went on for this. They get there and they can't get in the door. They climbed up on the roof, so they had to have a ladder. They came prepared. They evidently brought a ladder. They evidently brought some rope. Evidently, they, they brought some a claw hammer or a crowbar or something. And they just went to work. They were not going to take no for an answer. They believed this man would be healed. And you know, it seems that God has a way of passing over a million people just to get to somebody that will believe him. It makes a difference when you expect to receive. They came expecting to get this fellow healed. Now, this fellow had to have some faith himself, or he wouldn't have let him carry him up on that roof. Can you imagine carrying a sick fellow on a stretcher, carrying him up a ladder, getting him on the rooftop? He's got to be in agreement with this thing, or he ain't going, man. <laughs> so Jesus said, which is it easier to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, or rise up and walk? Now see, there's two or three things that could be involved here. This man could have been in his condition because of his sin. And Jesus said, your sins are forgiven you. Or it could have been that this man was condemned of his sins, and therefore couldn't release his faith. Now see, that happens quite often. John said, Beloved, if our hearts condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. Whatsoever we ask of him, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things which are pleasing in his sight. Now, if you have known sin in your life, then you're going to have a spiritual heart attack when it comes to asking God for healing or to receiving healing. That's not always the case, but I'm talking about when the Holy Spirit's been dealing with an individual. They're walking in known sin and refuse to repent. 
then it is very improbable that that individual would receive their healing in that condition. But now you take a sinner, you take an individual that's never known Jesus, never been born again. And some of the greatest miracles I've ever seen was people that were not even saved. Because, see, they didn't know Jesus. In fact, the Bible says they'll lay hands on the sick. Go ye into all the world. They'll lay hands on the sick. The believers will, and they shall recover. He's talking about the world there. So certainly an individual that's not even born again could receive divine healing. Sometimes they can receive it much easier than an individual that's been born again and walking in known sin. See? Now it's always, I believe the scriptures teach us, it's always God's will to heal when the conditions are met. And I think ultimately is the will of God that all people live in health. But there are certain situations in individual lives sometimes until that sin has got out, especially where God's already dealing with them about it. They know they're walking in known sin that they probably never will get healed. Some of them will die because they won't repent. Now, for instance, Hezekiah, God sent the prophet Isaiah in there and said, tell him, get his house in order, he's going to die. Well, he turned his face to the wall and began to cry out to God. He changed his position before God. Before Isaiah got out of the place, he sent the prophet back in there. He said, go back in there and tell him I'll give him 15 more years. Now, did God change his mind? No, God didn't change. God changeth not. It was Hezekiah that changed his position before God. All things left like they were, Hezekiah would have died. But because Hezekiah changed his position, he lived 15 more years. Now, you see what we're saying here? When Jesus said to this individual, thy sins be forgiven thee, it could have been that here's a man that has repented of his sins, but he just, you know, I've seen Christians that way. They said, well, I confessed it and I repented, but I still don't feel like God forgave me. What's feelings have to do with it? Jesus said, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. God's word is out. Your feelings has nothing to do with it. If you ask it in faith and believe God, then he did. The problem is they didn't believe he did. They asked it in unbelief. So when Jesus said, thy sins be forgiven thee, he got that condemnation off the old boy and he received his healing and God just took up his bed and went home. Isn't that good news? Amen. Now let's go to John's Gospel, the fifth chapter. There's something interesting here. Let's start with verse 2. Now there is at Jerusalem a sheep market, a pool, which is called the Hebrew tongue, Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, and a blind and withered and waiting for the moving of the waters. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool, troubled the waters, and whosoever... Then first, after the troubling the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. And when Jesus saw him lie, knew that he had been now a long time, in that case he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? And the impotent man answered and said, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. And Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. Now here's another method that Jesus used to, to bring healing to the sick. If you notice, it says nothing about touching this man. He spoke the word to him. See, the faith and boldness of others can sometimes spark the faith and ignite the faith that is in the individual. Now, I want you to notice that here's a man been this way 38 years, and there's just one season of the year, the angel came down and troubled the waters. Now, he's just got one chance in all of this multitude of ever getting in that pool and getting healed, but he's been there for a long time. Now, he really wanted to be healed, didn't he? I mean, if he's laying out there crippled like that for all this time. And when Jesus walks up to him, he said, Wilt thou be made whole? Now, he didn't ask him if he wanted to be. Sometimes we misunderstand what he said. He didn't say, Do you want to be made whole? He said, Will you be made whole? 
There's a difference in somebody that wants to be and somebody that will be. See, it was an act of his will. He might have wanted to, all right, but if he just wanted to and wasn't willing to obey the command of Jesus, he'd have still been crippled when he died. Jesus said, wilt thou be made whole? Well, you know what the fellow did. He started talking about his problems immediately. But then Jesus said to the man, rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately he was made whole, took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Jesus always got in trouble on the Sabbath day. And I want you to get this picture, because here's a man that's been crippled for 38 years. He's lost all hope, evidently, of ever being healed. He has a grow worse image in him, and he's laying there, and Jesus comes along, a man that he's not seen, never seen him before. He walks up there and said, will you be made whole? He said, well, yeah, if I had a man, I would, that could get me in the pool. Jesus said, rise, take up your bed and walk. The old boy just gathers up his bed, loads it on his back and starts home. And he's walking through the temple and the Jews stop him and say, now, it's the wrong day to carry your bed. (laughs) And he said, but the fellow that healed me told me to carry my bed. They said, who was this guy? And he stops and he I can just see him scratching his head and thinking. He said, you know, come to think of it, I don't have any idea who the guy was. Never saw him before. Now get this. Here's a man that's been laying there crippled. He's been that way 38 years. Some guy walks up he don't even know and said, rise, take up your bed and go home. And he just gathers up his bed and starts home. And has no idea who he is. He has no idea he's ever healed anybody. There was something about the words of Jesus that ignited the faith that was in that fellow. And he just gathered up his bed and went home. But now we can read and study the word of God and find out that Jesus heals the sick. And that the doctrine of the laying on of hands is one of the fundamental doctrines of Christ. And we can study and find out that faith has something to do with it. Turn with me to Mark, the fifth chapter. Let's begin with verse 22. Behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet, fell at Jesus' feet. And he besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. Now notice, evidently, here's a man that has heard that Jesus, and has probably been in some meetings where he laid hands on the sick. And he said, If you come lay your hands on my daughter, she'll live. And Jesus went with him. And much people followed him and thronged him. A certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, had suffered many things of many physicians, spent all she had, was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. Now listen to what about this woman. Here's a woman that has had this problem for twelve years. She spent all of her money. She might have been rich at one time. She got no better. In fact, she got worse. So she's got a grow worse image. Wouldn't that develop? That kind of thinking in you, if everything you tried, you got worse. And she comes up behind Jesus while he's going to Jairus' house. And here she is saying, if I may but touch his clothes. Verse 28, for she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. Now the Amplified says she continually said that. Now notice the confession of her faith with her works of going to touch Jesus' garment brought the manifestation of the healing power of God in her behalf. She went for the purpose of being healed. She said everything else has failed, but this will work. Now what was she doing going to touch the the hem of Jesus' garment? See, in the book of Numbers, God told them to sew a fringe around the border of their garment. That fringe was to remind them of their covenant with God. 
That's what she was after. She said, when I touch that hem that is symbolic of the covenant, I'll get my healing. Now, there's some strange things involved here that maybe sometimes we don't understand that Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, is the very man that can have this woman stoned to death for doing what she's doing. She took her life in her hands to get out in public like that because under the old law, which they were still under, she could be stoned for being in public in that condition. And when she gets to Jesus, the man that has the right to have her stoned is standing right there by Jesus, Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue. So she slipped up behind Jesus. She touched the hem of his garment. For she had said, if I but touch his clothes, I'll be restored to health. Now what she did, she changed that girl worse image by her confession of faith. She confessed what would happen. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up. She felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? The disciples said, Well, what do you mean who touched you? Why, there's thousands of people crowding around you. A lot of people touched Jesus. Some of them just touched him to see if any sparks would fly. Just to see if anything had happened and nothing happened. But when the touch of faith came, immediately he felt the power of God flow out of him into this little woman. And you notice what happened. She said, when I touch his clothes, I'll be restored to health. She said it. She went down through the crowd and she did it. And then she received it. And the last thing that happened was she felt it. See, she got her healing before she felt it. The last thing that happened was she felt better. And sometimes we want to feel it. Somebody said, well, I'll believe it when I feel it. Or I'll believe it when I see it. Well, God doesn't do any credit business. You got to believe it first. You believe you receive. And see, she programmed herself to believe that by the confession of her faith. And thank God she did receive her need met. The Bible says that she testified and told them all the truth. Now, that's how they found out that she'd been that way for 12 years. They had a testimony service. And she told about all how everything had happened in them 12 years. Now, see, that's taking time. They'd probably had an hour's testimony service there. And Jesus is on his way to heal Jairus' daughter. And then the runner comes and says, Jairus, don't trouble the master any longer. Your daughter's already dead. Listen to what Jesus said. He turned to Jair. As soon as he heard that, he turned to Jair and said, Fear not, only believe. Now let me show you something. He said, Jairus, this is not the time to start trying to make faith confessions. You'll get in fear if you do. You'll get in strife if you start talking. Because he could have said, If you hadn't stopped and healed this Baptist lady, you'd got there in time to heal my little daughter. But he didn't do that, see. And Jairus didn't say a word. See, he rested in what he's already said. He said, if you come lay your hands on my little daughter, that she may be healed and she shall live. And Jesus said, fear not, only believe. Don't do anything but believe what you said. And that's exactly what he did. And he got exactly what he believed, didn't he? You see, sometimes we make a mistake. When we're believing God for something, already believe God for it, already confessed something, and then when it looks like things are not working out, we change our confession. Jesus said to Jairus, fear not, only believe. Believe what you've already established. Because you see, your faith is not always the same level. When faith is high, he established this. Jesus, you come to my house, lay your hands on my daughter, she'll live. But then the runner came and gave the bad news. And he was tempted to do otherwise. But Jairus didn't say a word. And Jesus went right on down there and got his little daughter raised from the dead. She's already dead, all right. But he raised her from the dead. But I'm satisfied if Jairus had begun to speak doubt and unbelief and gotten strife, he'd had a funeral the next day. So sometimes we have to hold fast to the faith and what we confess. Now, this woman, though, uh, there's something I left out there. I want to put this in with it. 
in verse 33, the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. But he saith unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Now somebody said, yeah, but you see, Brother Caps, Jesus healed that woman. No, the Bible didn't say that Jesus healed her. Jesus said to the woman, your faith made you whole. Now, it's true the power of God flowed out of Jesus into the woman and effected a healing in her. And a miraculous healing at that. But Jesus didn't even know she was there until the power flowed out of him. Here's a woman that slipped up behind Jesus and touched the hem of his garment. And because of her faith, the power of God flowed out of her and healed her and delivered her. And she was set free. And Jesus told her why it happened. He said, your faith has made you whole. So see, the power of God comes when we release our faith. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. The Lord shall raise them up. That's one of the methods of being healed is the prayer of faith. But yet the laying on of hands, you know, there's something that we've really not understood. And I'm still studying it and looking into it. Jesus never did pray for the sick. Never did in all of his ministry pray for the sick. You know, that astounded me when I found that out. He ministered predominantly by the laying on of hands and by the spoken word. Never did pray for the sick. Now, it's all right to pray for the sick. The Bible, James says, anoint them with all the prayer of faith that save the sick. Then if you study the disciples and the apostles, you'll find out, I think you'll find they hardly ever prayed for the sick. Now, Peter knelt down and prayed when he raised the woman from the dead. But I think you'd be hard-pressed to find where the apostles ever prayed for the sick. They ministered by the laying on of hands or by a faith command to rise up and walk. Now, you know that that would have to be faith, the individual's faith, would have to be sparked in that to get a healing that way. And we see that in the book of Acts. In fact, let's turn there to the book of Acts, the ninth chapter. And let's notice something that happened with Peter when he came down to the saints that dwelt at Lydda. Acts chapter 9, verse 32. It came to pass as Peter passed throughout all quarters, he came down to the saints which dwelt at Lydda. Now notice, he came to the saints. I mean, he's born again, spirit-filled, tongue-talking, full gospel businessmen. (laughs) (laughs) And there he found a certain man named Aeneas who had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. Now, here's a saint that I remind you. He's a saint. He's a born-again, full gospel businessman. But he's sick and he's crippled. He's been this way for eight years. He's kept his bed eight years and he's sick of the palsy. You know, I'd have been sick of it too if I'd have had it eight years. (laughs) Now, there's something in that. Some of you need to get sick of your sickness. Need to get sick and tired of being sick and tired (laughs) and do something about it. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas who had kept his bed eight years, was sick of the palsy. Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole, arise, make up thy bed. And he arose immediately. Now what happened here? Here's a man that's a saint. That's what he said. He went to the saints that dwelled in Lydda. So we know this man was born again, probably spirit-filled. This man had faith to be healed, but he wasn't healed. Now, why wasn't he healed? Because he had not acted on his faith. See, we must act on our faith. You find Jesus in his ministry, in the healing ministry. He went into a synagogue one day, and there's a man with a withered arm, and they're watching him to see if he's going to heal this guy. Jesus said, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day or evil? 
They just held their peace. They wouldn't say anything. They knew they couldn't get in trouble if they did. So he looked at this man and he said, stand up. The old boy stood up. He said, now stretch forth your hand. Now you see, here's the boy with his hand all curled around and withered. And Jesus asked him to do something that no cripple could do. Stretch forth your hand. Now you see, Jesus ministered under the principle of calling things that are not. How can the crippled, withered hand be stretched forth? Only if it's well can he do that. Now he could have said, but Jesus, my hand is crippled. And he could have made all kinds of excuses. But he didn't. The Bible says he stretched it forth and it was whole as the other. It was when he acted on that. So the words of Jesus and his boldness sparked the man's faith and he was healed. I think sometimes what happens, it just bypasses his intellect and he spoke right into his spirit and the man acted from his spirit before he knew he couldn't do it, see? And sometimes things happen that way. By acting on the word of God. Now, when someone says, well, I just guess I don't have faith to be healed because I'm not healed. Well, you could have faith to be healed and not be healed like this man was. There's another incident in the 14th chapter of the book of Acts where Paul went down to this place and preached the gospel. See, the gospel is the power of God. Good news is the power of God. And as he preached there, there was a man that was crippled from his mother's womb. And as he preached, the Spirit of God revealed to Paul and said, this man has faith to be healed. Now, Paul's walking back and forth there. I'm sure that Paul is thinking, if that guy has faith to be healed, look like he'd be up walking. Now, this guy's never walked a step in all of his life. Not one. He don't know how to walk. If he was well, you'd have to teach him how to walk unless something supernatural happened because just because you're 38 or 40 years old doesn't mean you can walk. You have to learn if you've never walked. And the Spirit of God said the man has faith to be healed. Now Paul's just walking back and forth. I can just see him walking back and forth preaching and all of a sudden he just stops right in front of that guy and says, Stand up right on your feet! The old boy just jumped up before he knew he couldn't do it. He leaped up and walked. Now for all that years, from the time he's born, he never walked one step. But you know what everybody had said to him probably? Oh, bless your darling heart. God works in mysterious ways. It'll be worth it all one of these days. You just hold out a little longer and it'll all be over. You just never know why God crippled you like that. And get him to bawling and squalling and give him a bunch of sympathy and he sat there in his self-pity. But I imagine this is the only man that ever said to that man, stand upright on your feet. Amen. And it sparked the faith that was inside him. See, the Bible says he had faith to be healed. But he wasn't healed. See, you have to have a point of contact to release your faith. The laying on of hands is a point of contact to know when to release your faith. See, you can tell when somebody lays hands on you. You can physically feel it. That's the time that you begin to believe that I receive my healing. See, if I came into this town and said, uh, well, now, Brother Alderman, call him on the phone. We need to get together. He said, well, when? Oh, just any time. He said, well, where? Oh, just anywhere. <laughs> How long do you think it'd take for us to get together in this city? You are never going to get together. You haven't established a time nor a place. And see, the laying on of hands is establishing a time and a place that you released your faith to believe that you receive your healing. And then when you release that, begin to say, thank God, I believe I received my healing. You may not have the manifestation of it then, but it's a time and a place where you believe you received and begin to confess what God says about it. Can you see that? Now, if we just go by feelings and sight, 
We're going to miss a lot that God does. But you see, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance. Now here are two Bible examples of a man, the one that Peter walked up to and said, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. What Peter did, he just reminded the fellow what Jesus had done for him. And I can just see that old boy laying there. And, and Peter comes up and says, man, let me remind you that Jesus Christ already made you whole. He said, that's right. Just gathered up his bed and went home. I was in a meeting in California, Believer's Convention with Brother Copeland several years ago. And I taught one morning on don't blame God. God didn't make you sick. God didn't cripple you. You might have thought he did, but he didn't. It's the devil. And I'm out at the book table after the service and this woman comes up. She's in a wheelchair, and she's ready for a fight. <laughs> Brother Caps, God put me in this wheelchair, she said. I said, no, sister, God didn't put you in that wheelchair. Yeah, I know he did, too. No, he didn't. I said, what makes you think God put you in that wheelchair? Well, if it hadn't have been for me being crippled and paralyzed, I couldn't have authored this book that I've just wrote. I was afraid to ask her what the title of the book was. <laughs> I said, sister, God is not the author of confusion. He is the giver of all good gifts. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. God didn't make you have a wreck. Oh, yes, he did. And boy, I mean, you know, I wasn't arguing. I'm just quoting her the word. She's arguing and I'm quoting the word. And she got pretty upset about it. Tears come in her eyes and, you know, she just, she wanted some sympathy. But sometimes that's the wrong thing to do to people. You can do it in love, but you've got to say what the word says. So finally she left and kind of in a huff. Now Jerry Savelle was teaching the next session. That was morning session and the afternoon session at 1 or 1.30. Well, he got up there and he got to talking about acting on your faith and acting on the Word of God. And I'm outside. I had already stepped out and was in the hall and I heard all of this roaring, you know, and I got to wondering what was going on. I asked somebody. They said, oh, this some lady got out of a wheelchair and pushed it down front. It was her. So you see, when you find out God didn't do it, it's easy to believe that God will help you get out of it. Amen. God's not the one that did it. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. Jesus said, I am come, that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your word. We rejoice because the anointing of God flows forth from the word of God. Father, you sent your word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. And we fully expect the word of God has already done its work in this place this afternoon. That your anointing will minister to the lives of every person under the sound of our voice and those that hear it by tape. That it will set them free in Jesus' name. And we thank you for it. We praise you for it. And we rejoice over it. In Jesus' name.